Okay. <laughs> this makes it a little bit more exciting. So um, today I would like to share a very personal story with you because um, in my business, in my personal uh, life, I'm a, a computer scientist. I'm very passionate about building um, digital assistance for people in their various tasks. So from operators in production facilities to students in medical environments who want to learn specific procedures. So it's a very broad spectrum. But my secret life uh, is uh, I'm, a, actually, uh, I'm an part of a community, an invisible community. A community uh, who's uh, uh, mainly consisting of women. A community who's not really community because we are, don't even know each other. Uh, we don't have an identity. I'm an informal carer. And I care for my grandmother. This is her. Uh, her name is Amma. Since I was a child, I couldn't say Oma, so I said Amma, and this somehow stuck, so the whole family still calls her this way. I can take care of her together with my dad, um, and we are building this kind of a family network of support um, for Amma. And we're doing this long distance. Amma lives about five hours away from either of us, and my dad and me were separated by 10-hour drive. So this doesn't make things easier, of course. So um, one of the things, of course, we've been doing, so we, we found a uh, trustable cleaning lady, we find health professionals who stop by several times a week. Uh, my dad takes care of her finances, all these kind of things. And of course, we call her. We call her a lot on the phone. But this is not easy. Often enough, she doesn't hear the phone. Um, and then later on, she's upset because I hadn't called her. Um, or, uh, like uh, just a few days ago, I ruined her day by waking her up in, their, uh, in her nap time. So, um, and then when I finally reach her on the phone, uh, then I have to go through all these questions. I have to ask her, have you taken your medicine? Have you been out for a walk? Who came to visit? Were the health professionals there? And, and all of this is quite exhausting on my side as well as on her side. And later I find out my dad just called two hours before and she asked the same questions. And uh, when I talk to her about her health status, about how she's feeling and how her mood is, I don't actually get the right and correct answers most of the time. Because either she doesn't want to tell me because she doesn't want to burden me with something, or she just plainly doesn't realize that her mood has been going down or her health has been going down. So as a computer scientist and a researcher, of course, um, I had to think about this, like, this cannot be true, that this is the only, we are the only people who are experiencing this. And this is rather stressful. So for us in formal cares, there's always this 10% of our minds always attached to our ama in the background, always thinking, I hope she's okay. Did she get up this morning? This insecurity really uh, kind of kills you. So uh, we looked into numbers and we figured out, actually, there are quite a lot of people uh, in Austria who take care of their loved ones. So it's at least a million people um, like us uh, who are actually um, uh, doing this, at least, because I think this is an underestimation. And over time, with our democratic de development, I'm sure this will uh, increase. So, OK, so this is a big community. Let's look at um, what their... Um, what their characteristics are. Let's look at their work situation. Only one third of the people who are informally taking care of their loved ones are employed. Another third had to give up that job completely or um, reduce it quite a bit um, in order to help. So that means that this population actually is worse off than other parts of the population. So there's less money because you have less time to actually work. So this is uh, unfortunate, but if you look at the health situation, this really um, is much more dire. Um, half of the people, so half of us, are actually neglecting our own health. That means we are not going to the doctors in time, we are not doing any preventive stuff, we are not doing enough sports, we are not eating right, all these kind of things. And that leads one out of 10 informal carers to become seriously ill, um, so ill that they themselves need informal carers. So now if you think about informal carers really provide the glue 
in between in our health system. We take people to the doctors, we, we get the prescription, we go shopping, we do all these kind of things. So I think it would actually be good to think about ourselves, to think, okay, let's, what can we do for us as informal carers? And it actually turns out when we talk to informal carers, what do they want the most? First of all, they want the most, they want to have an awareness what's going on with their loved one. They want to get a peace of mind. They want to reduce the stress which is always sitting on their, on their necks. The second thing is they want to have help in everyday activities. And the third thing is they want to have more quality time with their loved one. So as a computer scientist, again, I have to do something, right? So we cannot just sit this there, we have to find solutions. And looking at our little um, family network there, the question is, what can we do? So one thing would be, of course, for uh, uh, either of us, my dad or me, to move to Ama or move her to our place. We tried this. We didn't manage to convince her. So the second best thing would be to have Sandra, a charming young lady, living with Ama, to observe all the things she's doing. Does she get up in the morning? Did she actually cook her coffee? Did she, um, did she spend her wellness hour in the bathroom? Did she go for a walk? All kind of, of these things. Yeah? Um, and since having an actual person in the household is for most of us not affordable, the question is, can we actually do this with technology? And surprisingly, for me surprisingly, uh, when we asked informal carers, 75% actually think that a digital assistant can be of use and would actually be welcomed by them. So let's think about what can such a digital assistant, such Sandra, actually do. So she can uh, monitor the energy consumption. So she can figure out if Ama was awake all night. She can figure out if the coffee uh, has been cooked. She can figure out if lunch, if she's making her lunch. Uh, through a camera on the door, she can see who has come to visit and uh, if Anna, Ama has been going out, if she has been going for walks, if she went shopping. Uh, Emma can. Uh, Sandra can identify through uh, the uh, medical bottles, um, the smart ones, if she took her medicine or not. The mirror in the bathroom can tell her how the mood is going, how reaction times are actually evolving over time. And if they are going down slowly, then she can nudge my dad or me and, or in order to really make us do something. Um, she can uh, coordinate our calendar, which we have with Ama in order for keeping track of her doctor's appointments. She can link it to my calendar when I'm on a business trip, uh, she would know, and also with my dad when he's on one of his opera journeys, he, uh, she, she would also know. So she, has, she is kind of the, uh, the keeper of the network, and she could be uh, making this um, available for us. And what I really would like to have is just look at one look on my smartphone and to see today Ama is doing fine. She's happy, she already went for a walk, and she's doing her normal routine. For most of the cases, this is already um, enough, because then in the evening when I call her, I have all the information there. I can ask informed questions. I can ask, oh, uh, how was the visit uh, of your neighbor, and discuss really these kind of things instead of getting stuck and bogged down with all this administrative stuff. So. This is actually something we can do right now already. All this technology is out there. Most of the time it was designed to support the elderly person directly. So it's all this assistant living, um, assistance technology which is out there. So we could also use it for the informal carers to give the informal carers their peace of mind in order to help um, do a better caring. But of course we can go much, much further. So sensors become much more closer to our um, to our bodies um, every day. So for example, this uh, really ugly wristband, uh, it can take uh, a lot of um, sensors from the body, such as blood pressure and uh, stick, uh, skin conductivity. And with this, uh, we played around and a team of students was actually able to figure out through the usage of such a little AI, which we now call biomusic, um, that uh, uh, if somebody is really, really excited, nervous, really uh, stressed out, or if that person is very depressed. We can also figure out if you really, really like the music or if you really, really hate it. So these are the kind of things you can figure out. So what if we now link this to a music provider such as Spotify, then uh, we can play um, upbeat music to, for people who are feeling down, and we can play uh, 
quieting music to people who are very, very excited. So the question is, would this really help AMA in any way? We would have to try, but I have an example from about a year ago. She called me on the phone. She was in tears. She was hysterical. She, was, uh, she got a letter from the city, and she was convinced that her services would be cut off and she would have to pay a big fine. I don't know where she got this from, but it took me and my dad two hours to calm her down. After that, I was not good for use for anything anymore. Uh, I was totally exhausted. She was totally exhausted. She was very much in danger during this time of, of hypertension, so to say, because she nearly fell a few times and um, her blood pressure went through the roof. So at that time, to play soothing music at the moment where this happened would actually make her aware of that she's freaking out like this. Because often enough, they don't they need some time, some distance then to realize, oh, now I was really getting out of, uh, uh, out of the system. And well, what it turned out in the end was that the letter she got was only about the garbage truck schedule and that it just had changed and uh, that was all of it. And uh, it would have been uh, easier to discuss this when she had her tea and calmed down. So these are the kind of technologies which are coming, which are now popping up all over the world. All over the world, there are labs and entrepreneurs working on more sensors, more kind of technology we can use um, to help our um, loved ones. But all of this will only be really working if we have a basis for this, a trust in this technology. And for this, we need, on the one hand, trustable technology and trustable um, AI, and on the other hand, explainable AI, as we just uh, heard in a few talks before. So this is why we at the No Center have now initiated a four-year research project with 10 PhD students, where we want to look specifically in, uh, inside these two topics, specifically looking into how can we do analytics on encrypted data, so that each of you can encrypt your data, be absolutely sure nobody can um, read it, and at the same time, you can do certain analytics on top. And on the other side, to look at explainability, to understand better why Sandra would make a certain decision, why Sandra was actually um, uh, calling uh, the emergency, for example. If we would have such a technology, then this could become uh, the basis for a lot. And now, oh, my bio music was just trying to calm me down uh, as well because I'm quite nervous up here. So um, we can now uh, think more or um, uh, wider about this future of um, informal carers. So right now, Sandra is the coordinator of our little family um, network. But what would be if we could link into this family network um, uh, more and more players? So for example, players uh, like the Red Cross, who could provide cer certain services, emergency services. We could link into this uh, more people who really provide physical help to um, AMA. Because of course, if you're an elderly person, not only virtual, digital help, uh, you're you need, you need a lot of real physical help. And these uh, kind of services we could bring in there. And Sandra could be the one understanding the need and the context of AMA to really propose uh, the right services to her and to us in order to help her out. But to complement, so this would really be the blue part of this network. But to complement this is actually something happened. Um, the No Center, which I'm uh, the CEO of, uh, has been growing quite a lot. And we have more than 100 people now. And some one thing which I did not expect happened. We have now more informal carers in the No Center than before. So there are more people like me who actually take care of their loved ones. And now I see the situation from an employer point of view. Now I see that people get really stressed out because they don't know what's happening with their loved ones. They, uh, they are on the phone all the time and, or they get um, much more easily sick. They have a much higher likelihood for burnout. So the question is, shouldn't we as employers also take much more responsibility in supporting informal care since they are already doing quite a lot of work for the um, community anyway? So we could provide other kind of help, other kind of help services in this network. So there are outside um, help services in for burnout prevention, for, um, for
for uh, fitness trainings, for nutrition. There are all these kind of help support um, uh, agencies could link this in there and then Sandra would not be only be the coordinator for AMA but it would really she would be the coordinator for the whole um, informal caring um, system and my vision for the future would be that in the future the informal carers would actually be a real community that we would really know each other that we would be visible that we would be less stressed and more happy uh, and that our work care life balance would be much much better and if you think about it it would affect a million people alone in austria wouldn't this be great thank you <laughs>